You take four good-looking young men from the US, Spain and Switzerland, three classically trained singers, one of those a former heavy metal singer as well, add a French pop star to the mix, get them to sing standards rather than opera, but in an operatic way, concentrate on the power of their voices in unison, and you've got Il Devo, the most successful pop opera ensemble in history. Record sales of 30 million. Highly successful tours, sometimes with other big stars like Barbara Streisand. In the repertoire, pop, bolero, folk, sacred, traditional, Latin. Impresario Simon Cowell had the idea you could continue the success of the legendary three tenors by tweaking the repertoire and adding more sex appeal. And he was right. It's been a long time together for the young men. They're now in their late 40s. And the aptly named Timeless Tour brings them to Spark Arena for one show in Auckland next month. For all this to work, of course, they needed to be able to sing. Il Devo's American tenor, David Miller, is with us. Hi there, how are you? Very well. The power of the voice, we just heard a sample of it. Are your voices in good shape for New Zealand? Um, I should hope so. Uh, we're actually in the middle of our Japanese leg of the tour, and uh, we've been playing to uh, some lovely, lovely audiences here, and everyone seems in fine shape, in fine voice, and you know, we're, we, once we kind of get into that groove of, of being on the road, uh, which we are at this point, um, it's kind of like just going to the gym. As long as you keep going to the gym, you stay in shape. <laughs> I imagine there's the odd voice crisis or has been over the years, though. That would be inevitable, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, there's, there's no escaping. You know, we spend so much time on airplanes um, and moving from cl different climates, different time zones. The body just gets fatigued after a while. And when that happens, then you're susceptible. And, you know, but everyone kind of has their own regime of how to take care of their voice, not only technically, but also, you know, like, we take zinc, we take echinacea, we just try and sleep as much as possible, hydrate. Um, but, yeah, it does come up. It does happen. It has been a long time at the top now for you guys. How well do you all get on out of interest? Actually, we are getting on uh, better than we ever have. Um, this last album, Timeless, uh, was our first venture into uh, self-producing. And so this kind of brought us together and bonded us in a way that we didn't really have before. I mean, we, we've all had bonding experiences for the past 15 years, but um, just as being the singers, you know, being the kind of the cogs in the wheel of the record company machine, as it were. Um, but then, you know, we decided to take the bull by the horns and create an album that really reflected our own musical nature and, and the four of our musical tastes and, and the repertoire that we think is just epic and, and amazing. And, and so kind of seeing things from the other side of the fence really brought us together in a, in a, in a form of cooperation that we had never seen before. And, you know, we're like brothers at this point. That's interesting, and that's obviously gratifying, because you must, in the beginning, all have come in with egos. You were stars in your own right, <laughs> and I, I'd, be, I'd be assuming there were turf wars over the years. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when we were first put into a room together, um, we, we literally met each other for the first time in the studio on day one of recording, because yeah. we had been auditioned separately by the record company. And so they put us in a room and said, here are some songs, what can you guys do with this? And we all looked at each other and, you know, we've got cultural background differences, we've got language differences, we've got stylistic differences. So each one of us had a different impulse of where we felt the song should go and how it should stack and whose voice should take what parts. And not that any of us were right or wrong, it's just that our impulses were, uh, were such as being solo singers, um, we were only ever in charge of our own impulses of what we brought to the stage. Like for myself as an opera singer, all I ever had to worry about was making sure that I knew my part and I interpreted my character thoroughly. And uh, so I, I was, we, were all, we were all our own bosses. So those, those first few recording months, there were some, some kind of el, you know, elbowing, jockeying for position, but then we all realized after we had kind of completed the first couple of songs, we were like, oh, Oh, we're a team. Oh, great. Okay. So I can, I can just relax a little bit. 
<laughs> you yourself had to make a choice, I think, between a debut at the New York Metropolitan Opera or presumably true. or or saying to Simon Cowell, I'm on board, count me in. Is that how it happened? That's pretty much how it went down. Um, we had started the recording process, and we were about four months deep, and we had uh, completed the recording of the album, and we had already listened back to what was close to being the final mixes, and it was great. And so then they said, all right, so now we need to start looking ahead towards promotion. Um, October, November, December, I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, hang on. Um, I actually have my debut at the Metropolitan Opera in November, so um, yeah, we're going to have to reschedule that. And they're like, I'm sorry, you, what? We don't care. <laughs> are you in or are you out? Because um, we need you to be 100% available 24 seven in order to make this work. That's just how this industry works. So I had to do some soul searching around that. I had to uh, go away and think for a little bit. And, and I thought, and, and the deciding factor was that in the 12 years of being an operatic tenor, I had literally gone through 95% of the roles uh, that were appropriate for my voice in that age category, in that bracket. So I'd already done everything in the repertoire, maybe not on the level of the Met, um, but at, th at that point, probably for the next 10 or so years, it would have just been repeats, I'm doing La Traviata, La Boheme's, and this and that, just in, you know, hopefully bigger and bigger houses. But this was an opportunity for me to use my voice, use my technique in a way that would reach such a much wider audience. And, you know, we're not actually singing opera per se, but we, we began cultivating what we later coined the term the opera curious. And we were cultivating an audience that wouldn't think ever to go and see an opera before having seen or heard our voices. And we kind of broke down that stereotype, you know, that opera is somehow for, for the rich and hoity-toity. So that, that was the deciding factor for me. There was, there was such a much larger benefit uh, to going in and kind of becoming the happy Gilmore of opera um, and, and kind of bringing in a much wider audience that then may circulate. I mean, so many people have told me over the last 15 years that they went to their first opera because they saw Il Divo. And that was so gratifying. And it just, it, it turned out to be absolutely the right choice. It took Simon Cowell a long time to find you guys, uh, three years of searching for the right mix. So it was nevertheless a hard choice for you. I mean, looking back, maybe it, in hindsight, it was the right choice, of course. But did you ever think then it might not work? The world had had the three tenors. They might not want any more of that style. And obviously the mm. world did. But it must have been a risk for you professionally. It was. It definitely was. There was no precedent for uh, what we were trying to achieve. You know, the three tenors, they basically went out, and even though they were singing together, they were still singing opera or at least art song, um, kind of Italian Neapolitans. You know, they weren't singing things like Abba's The Winner Takes It All. No. You know, they weren't kind of converting these pop songs and these kind of iconic things that really belong to a different musical universe. They weren't trying to incorporate them or, or operaticify them. And neither were we. We weren't trying to make these things into operas. We were just kind of lending a nod to the style of, and, and in doing so kind of pioneered a whole other genre in a way. But there was a risk because, like I said, there was no precedent for this. There was no built-in audience. Um, you know, the three tenors, they had a built-in audience because they had been singing opera for decades. Yeah. And, you know, so that, that kind of was a, a no-brainer for them to all team up like that. Whereas there was no, you know, we had no idea. We had a product in our, in our bank. You know, we had, we had the first album that we were truly proud of, and it was groundbreaking, but had no idea if anyone was going to buy it. And, and, and then, you know, when it did debut and it did go to number one, and we all, the, the sigh of relief that we all breathed, you can't imagine. No, I bet. No, I bet I can't imagine. You must live quite separate lives, David, I'm assuming, and come together for recording and touring. You don't all hang out together all the time. <sighs> You know, we did for a while. Those those first couple of years, all four of us moved to London, and like I said, the record company wanted us to be on call tw basically 24-7. Well, maybe not 24, maybe 12. <laughs> yeah. But uh, they did let us sleep. Um, but... Uh, 
Yeah, we, we kind of lived in the same apartment building. And so we did spend a lot of time in the studio doing TV shows, but also, you know, we'd go out to dinner and, and we went to the occasional movie together. And, and kind of after that period was over, after we did our first, uh, our first couple of tours, um, we realized we didn't really need to be all together, all at the same time. So that's when we started reestablishing our, our individual personas uh, for ourselves and kind of cultivating a personal life. And that's been the balance ever since, is really trying to balance the amount of time that we spend together. It still is considerable. When we do get together on a tour, you know, we're in each other's pockets for months on end. So, we, you know, we need that personal time. It's the only, it's the only thing that keeps us sane. You know, when the, when the curtain comes down, we shake each other's hands, say, all right, good night, have fun. Carlos decides to go, you know, out to the club. I go straight to bed. Uh. Um, you know, everyone kind of has their own routine that they go to in order to keep themselves sane. You say you go straight to bed. Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on, on stage, you have traditionally been quite majestic in your approach. The choreography is precise. The image is important. Do you ever feel like clowning around or breaking into a rap? No. Yes, sometimes there's there's a couple impulses that kind of crop up every now and again. Rap, not so much. I kind of do the occasional beatbox every once in a while. Ah. Um, but none of us really have the skills, the verbal skills, <laughs> to go after a rap. Uh, but there is, there is some the, the the comedy aspect, the clowning around, showing more of our per, our personality shows up in our shows now more than it really ever has. Um, because that's what the people want at this point. You know, we did, um, we did 10 or 12 years of, you know, it's the four guys in suits and it's impeccably groomed. And the, like you said, the staging is very precise and the music is obviously, you know, as top notch as we can get it every single night. And it, it that, that's a little boring after a while. So, you know, it, at, at a certain point, I remember there were uh, there was a group of fans that kind of caught us after the show, and they said, how come you guys never sing by yourselves? How come you guys never sing solo numbers? And we took that to heart. And we have started incorporating into, uh, since the last tour of the Amore Passion tour, and now in this, uh, this uh, Timeless tour, we take those moments to uh, show up for ourselves and to do the music that animates us personally. For me, it's opera. For, for Carlos, uh, he, uh, in this one, he's singing Granada. Seb is doing a song off of his solo album. So showing up it for ourselves and establishing our own identities is really important. And that has also translated into feeling more of a sense of freedom on stage to be ourselves and to not be so precise. The music must be pristine. That's number one. But as for the rest, you know, we hit our marks and we can relax because we're not, we don't need to prove anything anymore. And has it worked, I suppose, is the question. I've, I mean, I've, I've read some reviews where you've started to add dancing and dancers and you're showing more of yourselves, as you said, you're adding edge. There was a time when those voices of yours were, you know, purely enough. So I suppose the, it can go two ways. The audience can lap up the new Il Devo or, you know, they can want the old Il Devo. How's it gone? Mm. Well, I think, I think it, it comes in stages, you know, and, and it goes in cycles. Um, I think in what we're discovering right now of there's a very large kind of Vegas element kind of going on with, with it right now, and, and people are loving it. We're seeing this translate everywhere, all around the world. People are connecting with us. They're connecting with, with the music. They're finding the dancers enjoyable, which actually brings in a lot more men, uh, too. <laughs> the, uh, you know, women are bringing their husbands, and the husbands are like, oh, something for me, too. But, uh, you know, it, now that we've kind of established this side of it, now we're talking about, okay, well, what are we going to do next? Because it's always about reinventing ourselves and, and not trying to be too repetitious. So we're already talking about, you know, doing a scaled back version possibly on the next tour, maybe doing something in a bit more intimate setting where it is just the four of us again. So we, we kind of, we're always trying to evaluate, you know, what is it people want and how do we keep ourselves fresh? Will you be able to do it 
forever. I mean, how long can you keep Il Devo going? Will you be like the Rolling Stones and you guys will be in your 70s and still enjoying it up on stage? What's going to be the story there? Well, that is a very good question, in fact, um, because there is a shelf life to the operatic voice. And it really depends, uh, you know, we're, we're doing our best to, to take care of our voices and take care of our bodies so that we can have as much longevity as possible. But, you know, there is, there is a truth in, in that the way in which we sing is more taxing than any other style uh, of music, meaning using the operatic technique. And it's, you know, it's like being a weightlifter. You can really, your body can really only support for so many years. Yeah. So as long as we keep our techniques clean and pristine, we could be doing this into our 60s if we don't kill each other, you know. We're, like I said, we're in great condition right now relationship-wise, but you never know what the future holds. There's so many variables going on. But, you know, we're, we're just... We take it one day at a time, one track at a time on an album, we take it one performance at a time on the tour. We try not to get too ahead of ourselves, try and stay very focused in the moment. I think, I personally think that's the key to longevity because if, you know, if you're, if you're planning so far ahead that you're not paying attention to the hurdles that are right in front of you, you will fall down. It's inevitable that the. It's interesting that to, to hear you say you've brought people to opera proper. It's inevitable though that the, the, the trade off, the price you pay for using those voices to sing standards, uh, the price you pay for getting legions of fans and big album sales is snobbery from some of the critics. Does that get under your skin? Well, you know, I think once upon a time it did at the very beginning. But there's also been um, there's been a lot of shifting that's happened throughout all of the musical industries, and I think that uh, the opera community, especially after the, the stock market crash uh, back in 2007, that hit so many of the American opera houses. I know it hit the world in general, but it hit the American opera houses the hardest. And uh, a lot of the places I used to sing have closed. And, and the world, the opera world has shrunk significantly. And especially, you know, as well with music moving into an online arena. Um, whereas uh, the operatic market, you know, beyond the performances, they, they still stick to traditional recordings, physical product, which doesn't really move. And we're finding that as well. You know, we make uh, the album that we're making and putting on sale people just don't buy albums the way they do because they're streaming yeah. and it's so much easier for the consumer to get their hands on music and it, it makes it really challenging for everyone because the money is not coming in we we have to spend the money to make the thing but uh, the money is not coming back so it it's it's really becoming a labor of love for everyone involved and i'm i'm finding as i'm observing a lot of the previous barriers between musical communities are starting to crumble because no one can really afford to stay in their ivory towers anymore. And so it's really all, even the Met, you know, it's all mm. about likes. <laughs> so, um, you know, people do still go to the opera and people still do love enjoying a live performance. And that for us in Il Divo is we're finding that to be exactly the same. Yeah, you make, we make an album so that we can have a tour. And you've made some very shrewd points about the state of opera, too. All the best for the rest of the tour in Japan, David. Thank you for your time talking to us. And uh, people in New Zealand, the fans, are looking forward to seeing you here. Well, we are looking forward to seeing the fans in New Zealand. Absolutely. We haven't been there for a really long time. We're, we're really looking forward to it.